Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk, uh, Abstracting Definitional Interpreters. Uh, this is by myself, David Dureas, and my colleagues, Nick, Phil, and David Van Horn at the University of Maryland. I'd like to start by asking you if you've ever written a program and asked yourself one of these questions about your program. Does my program, program cause a runtime error? Does my program allocate too much? Does my program sanitize all of its untrusted inputs? Is this proof object computationally relevant? <laughs> I threw that in for the dependently typed people because you think I don't need a program analyzer, but you can use one. Um, and these are all questions that could be answered by a program analyzer. And you're probably thinking, oh, well, my programming language doesn't have one. Sad face. Um, and even if your programming language does have an analyzer, it's rare that that analyzer is looking at the behavior or the property that you're interested in. So why not just roll your own program analyzer? This is easy to do, right? Well, you're probably thinking, this is maybe too challenging, maybe too much work, or requires too much expertise that you don't have. And the message of my talk is that rolling your own program anal analyzer is actually very easy. And it's easy if you already know how to write an interpreter. And seeing how this is ICFP, I'm going to assume that's everybody. <laughs> so all you need to get started is to write an interpreter. Um, and I'm going to show you how to start, starting from an interpreter, easily implement a programming anal analysis of your choice. So this technique is called abstracting definitional interpreters. Um, it's a systematic process of, like I said, going from interpreter to analyzer. And the result is a sound and terminating and precise and extensible program analysis, ta tailor, uh, custom tailored to your applications. So the context of this work is some prior work, abstracting abstract machines, that appeared here at ICFP in 2010. Um, AAM is a systematic framework for achieving sound and terminating analyzers, and it uh, does this through an easy-to-use methodology. Um, this work, ADI, it's a spiritual successor to AAM. It also gives you sound and terminating analyzers. It gives you extra precision out of the box than AAM gives you. Um, and I consider it even easier to use, because rather than needing to formulate your semantics as a small step transition system, you can work with these high-level definitional interpreters that are much easier to define and work with. So about this uh, extra precision note, so we get this extra precision through actually an observation that Reynolds made in 1972 about inheriting properties from your defining language. And in this work, we're actually going to inherit analysis precision from the defining metalanguage. And the result of this is going to be a pushdown analysis completely out of the box for free, inherited. And I want to remind you that there's a lot of papers on pushdown precision, um, and a lot of these papers sort of uh, they, they over-abstract to remove the precision, and then they have a lot of machinery to recover the pushdown precision. And we just cut all of that um, process, and we get it for free from the defining language. So the, the key challenges that any systematic approach to program analysis is going to address is first the, pro the challenge of how to remain uh, sound for an arbitrary analyzer that you derive. And for AAM and ADI, the story is almost exactly the same. Uh, the result of the process is a single parameterized interpreter or machine that recover, that, that one parameterized interpreter will recover both the concrete and abstract semantics. And that's how you maintain tight soundness between those two artifacts. The second key challenge for these frameworks is how to make sure your analysis terminates. And these are completely different answers for these two approaches. So in AAM, the idea is to iterate a transition system that's known to have a finite state space. And that, you can just observe, is going to always terminate. For ADI, there's no small step transition system, so we needed something a little more sophisticated. And that's the focus of this paper. And what we came up with to solve this termination issue for abstract definitional interpreters is a caching fixed point algorithm for unfixed interpreters. And I'll unpack what that is later in the talk. So I'm going to show you this technique by example. We're going to start with um, a concrete interpreter that's non-standard in just a few ways. I'm going to show you a partial abstract interpreter. And I mean partial in the sense that it doesn't always terminate. But it's, easy, it's an easy point to get to. And then I'll show you this caching fixed point algorithm to how to get a total abstract interpreter. So let's start with the concrete interpreter. Um, I'm going to show you a concrete interpreter that's non-standard in four ways. First, I'm going to use store allocation style for the binding of arguments. This is a standard trick we inherit from AAM. I'm going to use a monadic effect interface for the environment and the store for the interpreter. I'm going to leave uh, some things as parameters, like primitive operations and allocation. And we're going to end up with this interpreter being an unfixed style. So I'm going to do this in Racket, um, a great functional programming language that you all love. Um, and I'm going to write comments for some things that you may have written in actual code in Haskell. So I'm going to assume that we have some monad m, uh, and I'm going to assume some, some uh, monadic effects for reader and state for the environment and store. And here's my type signature. It's a monadic function from expressions to values. 
So let's get started. This is Programming Languages 101. Uh, we're writing an interpreter. We match on the expression. In the case it's a numeric literal, we return in the monad just that literal as a value. If it's a variable, we uh, do the ask n effect, which returns the current environment. And we perform, uh, we look up x in the environment, that'll give us an address, and we call this uh, function find, which is going to look up the value bound to that address. And I'm leaving find as a parameter, which is why I put it in italic purple. Let's get to some more complicated compound expressions. So here's uh, conditionals. Uh, it's the standard uh, top-down uh, recursive uh, definition that you're used to. We evaluate the conditional, we check to see if it's zero, and then we recursively evaluate either the left or the right branch. And for operators, we evaluate the left and the right-hand side, and then this uh, delta interpretation for operations as applied to values, I'm also going to leave that as a parameter and play with that later in the talk. Final two things I have in this language are lambdas and application, and this is the usual thing. Uh, lambdas evaluate the closures where I pair the lambda with its environment. And for application, we evaluate the function, pull out the closure, evaluate the argument. Here I'm allocating a new address A by calling alloc on X. Um, this is giving me a fresh address A. Um, X I'm leaving as a parameter, which extends the store to map A to that value. And then I um, update the closure environment with that new binding, and then go to evaluate the body of the lambda. So this is a complete interpreter with a few parameters and a slightly non-standard style. And the last non-standard thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rip out this explicit recursion in the interpreter. So right now this is a um, recursive definition, and instead I'm now going to take the evaluator to use for recursive positions directly as an argument, which I'm calling ev prime. If you've noticed, the type has now unrolled one level. Um, and anywhere where I called ev recursively, I put ev prime. So this is now a non-recursive um, definition of the evaluator. So to run this simple concrete interpreter, we need our favorite y combinator, uh, or a fixed point finder, um, which ties the knot, so to speak. And then to run our evaluator, we need to instantiate some stack of monads. So here I have reader t on top of state t on top of id. These are monad transformers. Um, and then I, uh, the first thing I do is I tie the knot on ev with the y combinator, and I call mrun, which just instantiates some initial state for the monadic state. You can run this evaluator. Here's a lambda x, lambda y, x, so the const function in Haskell, applied to four. And the result is a closure uh, where in the environment, x maps to the address zero. And in the resulting store, the address zero maps to the value four. So that's all there is to this non-standard concrete interpreter. I think you sh should all be able to write one of these if you wanted. And the reason we made these non-standard choices are for a few reasons. Um, and the overall, the reason is so we can support interpreter extensions. So the first thing we can do is, because we we've done it in this unfixed style, we can now intercept the recursive calls in the interpreter to maybe do some kind of instrumentation or something else at each point in the recursion. We can swap out different monads to get different monadic effects in the interpreter. And then we can change the definitions of these primitive operations, like alloc and the delta function. So here's an example of a simple extension. So this is going to be a tracing evaluator. It's going to evaluate your expression and then record all of the intermediate configurations along the way. So I'm going to ask for one extra piece of monadic effect, um, which is a writer, which is going to output the configurations that we see. EV trace is going to wrap around an unfixed evaluator. So we're one more level of unfolding in this unfixed world. Uh, so EV trace takes an evaluator, the final uh, thing to call in the case of recursion. We look up the environment and the state that we see. We use tell, which is the writer effect that outputs it to the output, the configuration that we're currently at, and then we go ahead and call the evaluator that we're wrapped around. So to run this analysis, um, we need to build some other stack of monads. Here I'm using reader t, writer t, and state um, to get the monadic interface satisfied. And then to run it, we apply the fixed point combinator after we wrap EV trace around EV. So EV trace and EV are going to mutually call each other. The Y combinator ties the fixed point at the end of the day. And then we can run this and say, for this example, adding 3 to 4 and then multiplying by 9, you get the result 63 and then the list of all the intermediate states along the way. So is, some people would call this maybe a dynamic analysis. So this was the, the reason that we did things in this non-standard way, was so we could support instrumentation. So now I'm going to, we're going to move from a concrete interpreter to start talking about abstract interpreters. So to make this interpreter an abstract interpreter, there's two things we need to do. We need an abstraction for primitive operations and primitive values, and we need an abstraction for allocation, because um, in the game that we're playing is that we need to make something abstract, um, which means to make it finite, for anything in our current language that had an infinite value space. So the only things that were there 
were um, integers and the addresses that we allocate in the store. So here's what those two steps look like. To abstract numbers, um, so here I'm relying on this monadic interface. I need two new monadic effects, one for failure, one for non-determinism. And I'm going to create my abstract number to include a symbol, tick n, in, in racket, um, where tick n is a symbolic representative of any possible integer. So, so delta, our interpretation of operations over numbers, now needs to handle um, the case when a number could be uh, an abstract number, tick n. So for, for plus, we're going to be conservative and just say the addition of two numbers, no matter what they are, we're going to be conservative and say that that's a number. But for division, in order to be sound and correct, we need to check for zero because the interpreter is going to needs to be able to fail and say, like, imagine this was a program analysis and you want to detect division by zero errors. This needs to be uh, return the possibility of fail failure in that case. So we ask zero question mark, which is a monadic operation. Um, and then if it could be zero, we fail. Otherwise, we return arbitrary number. Now, the zero question mark operation, it's monadic because we're going to um, handle the case for tick n in a special way. So asking if an arbitrary number tick n is zero, this could either be true or it could be false based on the actual concrete number that we've abstracted to be tick n. So here we use non-determinism in the monadic effect interface to just return both. So n plus is going to both return true and return false. In the case it was an actual number, we just compare that number with zero. So that's all there is to a simple abstraction for numbers. Um, now let's talk about abstracting addresses. So rather than using uh, new fresh integers in our uh, allocation procedure, let's do a very, very simple thing that has a finite uh, set of options, which is let's just use variables themselves as addresses. So here alloc x is just returning the variable x. And what this means is when we extend our store to map an address a to a value v, we can't overwrite that value, that would be unsound. We now need to join that value as this is the set of possible values that could appear at this address. So here I'm getting the store from the monadic state and I'm updating it, uh, taking the union of that and a singleton map from A to the singleton set V. So now we, you, now we have a, um, an abstract interpreter that we can instantiate with some stack of monads. There's getting more of them now, which looks scary. Um, and the evaluator just ties the knot with the Y combinator and runs it instantiating monadic state. And what we get is, here is um, an example of the identity function uh, that we apply to one and then apply to two. And because we're introducing abstraction in the semantics, the final expression, f of two, is going to return both one and two because x could take either of those values during the lifetime of the program. So this is a kind of standard control or data flow analysis. The problem with this interpreter is that it doesn't terminate. So if we write a trivial loop, it's going to run forever. There's nothing stopping it. So that's all there is to writing a partial abstract interpreter. And most of those tricks comes from the AAM framework. And the, uh, most of the focus in the paper, and what I'll focus on now, is how to take this uh, definitional abstract interpreter and make it terminate. So if you look at what happened in that looping example, um, the issue was that we were evaluating loop of one and the interpreter performed some work and then it got to the same point where it was interpreting the loop of one. And you're probably thinking there's an easy fix for this. And this is the first step in our approach, which is we need to, some way of remembering visited configurations. So uh, what we do is we instrument the interpreter to say, uh, look for states that it's already seen before. And if it's seen that state, um, just return the empty set because we've detected a loop. So this procedure will never, never return because we detected a loop. So this technique is actually a sound, um, although not always terminating thing to do for a concrete interpreter. For an abstract interpreter, because the state space is finite, it's actually sufficient for termination, but it's actually unsound in the presence of abstraction. So I wanna walk you through why this simple approach isn't enough. So here's uh, interpreting factorial. If you're playing ICFP bingo, I'm sure this one's already taken. Um, so here we're doing an abstract interpretation, a factorial of an arbitrary number. And we're going to apply this naive trick where if you see a loop, just cut out. So the interpreter is going to go to the body of the factorial. And here we're asking, is an arbitrary number, tick n, is that zero? And as we've seen, that's going to return twice. It's going to both return true and it's going to return false. So we're going to get a non-deterministic um, branching in the evaluator, where it's going to both return one for the base case and go to evaluate um, the recursive case. 
So here, we're, we're in the recursive case for factorial. We're going to end up subtracting 1 from tick n, and the result of that is going to be tick n. An arbitrary number minus 1 may as well just be an arbitrary number. So this evaluator will actually get to a state that it's seen before, factor, factorial of tick n, and this simple loop, this naive loop detection will say, I've already seen this configuration. This is going to be a loop and doesn't return. So this is the full result of evaluating this function with this simple loop detection. And the analysis is going to say, the result of this function is always 1. Factorial of any number is 1. And this is just wrong, right? Um, and so uh, one of the lessons from this paper is that you need more work to do loop detection in an abstract setting. Uh, what you think is sound for a concrete interpreter may not actually be sound for an abstract interpreter. So the second insight to the algorithm we describe in the paper is that you need to bottom out to some cached result. You can't just return empty set. We need something there that gets returned. So the fix here is rather than uh, detecting this loop and going to the empty set, we, have, we, we introduce a cache into the process of interpretation where if we see a state that we've seen before, we just look it up in this cache. Um, and without saying more about what's in that cache, we can, the evaluation of factorial tick n is going to return 1 or tick n times whatever is in that cache. So things are looking better. Um, the question now becomes, how do we compute this cache such that it has the right thing in it when we get to it to bottom out? And if you scratch your head a little bit, you're going to think, well, this cache, it really needs to be, have the same information in it as the interpreter. So now we have this mutually depending set of equations where I'd like to bottom out to a cache, but the cache need, is the thing that, I, you know, that I'm looking for. And what we actually do is we just compute the least, least fixed point of these equations for the cache. So if you just take these two equations, iterate them for you know, solving for the cache of factorial tick n, you're going to reach a sound approximation for factorial tick n. So what this means in terms of running your interpreter, um, so if you're doing this for your application, remember EV here is just that simple interpreter we wrote in the beginning. Um, EV cache is this thing that we give you. It's in the paper. It's an algorithm. Um, and it's going to intercept the points of recursion to bottom out to this cache. Then you tie the knot after you apply this. And then we also give you fixed cache, which is a very simple least fixed point uh, computation for that cache. Um, so for example, just that EV evaluator I showed you at the beginning, composed together in this way. If you run a looping computation, you're going to get the empty set, meaning it doesn't ever returns, which is correct. Um, and then you can run things like factorial, and it'll be sound. So this is uh, the whole approach. Remember visited con uh, configurations, bottom out to a cached result, um, and then compute the least fixed point of the cache. And there's a full caching algorithm in the paper. Back to this note about precision. Um, what we've actually recovered is not a zero CFA analysis, but actually a push down zero CFA analysis. And the reason for this is that there is no approximation for stack frames or control flow at all. Um, in fact, the call and return semantics for the abstract interpreter is actually handled by the meta language, which is Racket. And because Racket is precise in its semantics for call and return, we get precise abstract semantics for calls and returns, which is what is at the essence of pushdown precision. In fact, it exactly is pushdown precision. So there's more goodies in the paper. Um, there's more discussion about this pushdown analysis and how we recover it. We talk about global store widening. We discuss a more precise arithmetic abstraction. We show how to do sound symbolic execution. We talk about abstract garbage collection, which is also interesting because there's no explicit model for the stack. Um, and we have a proof of soundness via a big step reachability semantics, and that's provided in supplemental material to the paper. So I hope in this talk I have given you a little bit of enthusiasm that you really could go and write your own program analyzer just by using this uh, non-standard form of concrete interpreter and these tricks that we described in the paper. And you should think of program analyzers that, that you want to use in your applications as just slightly fancy interpreters. So that's, that's my technique. Uh, it's a systematic process for taking interpreters to analyzers, and the results are sound, terminating, precise, and extensible. And that's all I have. Thank you. I'll take questions.